First of all, thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, everybody here, for giving me some of your time. Uh, my name is Tvi Mostovich, and I'll be talking to you about designing a plugin architecture in Python. So, let's get started. A few interesting tidbits about me. I was born in Belgium. I grew up there. And uh, after high school, I moved to Israel. I started programming with this little cute device. I got this as a gift as a teenager. It was called the Psyon 5. Later, this became the basis of uh, Symbian OS and uh, Nokia. And the Psyon 5 came with uh, oper uh, OPL a user guide. OPL is a programming language, now defunct, does not exist anymore, or it's barely in use, but that I basically read it from cover to cover kind of the geek that I am, and that's how I learned pr how to program. In, uh, in my day-to-day, -day, I, I, I managed to merge two of my great passions, one of them being the algorithms of the Jewish calendar, the other one being the Home Assistant IoT platform. I suppose some of you heard about it. Uh, so I am the creator and the maintainer of the Jewish calendar integration. If anybody is interested to, to co-maintain it with me, you're more than welcome to join the effort. And in my professional life, I am what's called a pre-silicon validation engineer at Intel. I, anybody of you know what a pre-silicon validation engineer is? Yeah, okay. Uh, and obviously, that's not the usual audience. A uh, pre-silicon validation, just an uh, engineer, just a, a few seconds about it. Uh, what we do is we create software simulations of hardware design before we go to manufacturing. So Intel, big chip manufacturer, still manufactures most of the CPUs in the world. And uh, it's a very costly endeavor. Therefore, when we want to manufacture a chip, there is a very costly process of getting all the bugs before, the manufacture, uh, before we go into manufacturing. And one of the ways to do this is by creating a pre-silicon validation or pre-silicon simulation. We simulate a lot of inputs, check, them, check, the, uh, check the chip, try to catch as much as possible of the bugs so that we don't have any, other, uh, any bugs later in after uh, post-manufacturing. So that's about me. Uh, but enough about me. Let's get ahead into the meat of the matter. Uh, plugin architecture. Why would you like a plugin architecture for your, uh, for your application? So I'll demonstrate this with a different uh, tools from a different world. This is a, mul a multi-tool. A multi-tool has the great advantage of being, of being able to uh, have multiple uh, multiple extensions in one tool. And that's wonderful because w when you have to go ahead and uh, do a task, you grab your multi-tool and you have all the tools you need until you miss one. Until there is a, a single tool that's missing as part of your... Uh, as and then you, you need to go ahead and buy an extra tool and add it to, to your tool chest. And another way Another way to look at this, uh, this issue is what they did with the multi-bit screwdriver. So you have a screwdriver, and you can exchange the bits. You can exchange the bits. Not only can you exchange the bits, another manufacturer might be the one who will be creating the bits f that might match your interface. And that's what the plugin interface, uh, plugin uh, architecture solves. The plugin architecture provides you the capability, the capability of your application to focus on one task, be good at it, and maybe somebody else will come and extend that, the capability of your, of your tool much further than you anticipated, and they, can, they will actually even carry the burden of maintaining, the, uh, of maintaining that the extension. So let's take a look at a real-life example. A real-life example that comes from my day-to-day -day uh, work at Intel. One of my jobs is to maintain a code generation tool. It's written in Python. And that code generation tool, what it does is it 
takes some configuration. The configuration tells it, take this data, take, it, take this template, apply the data to the template, and you get some code. Obviously, it's a code generation tool. So this is a wonderful tool. It helps, it helps us a lot, but it can be extended in multiple ways. And I'll be, used, uh, I'll be using this example uh, during, the, during the rest of the presentation and show multiple ways how we can extend this application. So first of all, we want to, uh, we want to allow our application to know more, uh, to have additional filters. And for that, this is the way, this is the way where we, we want to add additional, fil an additional Jinja filters. The template we use is a template based, uh, is a template based on Jinja. And we want to allow the user to specify additional filters, not only what comes built in. Just as a show of hands, who knows here about Jinja? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, m <laughs> that's more kind of a, uh, but just a quick rehearsal for those of you who are unaware of it. So Jinja is a, a framework based on Python, a template, uh, templating engine. It's used by Django, it's used by Ansible, it's used by Home Assistant, it's used by Pelican. It's all around, the w it's all around of our Python eco ecosystem, and Jinja has the notion of filters. And filters are more or less air quotes. It's kind of your day-to-day -day Python method. So this is an example of some co Jinja code. And as you can see here, the, the, upper, the upper keyword is actually a filter. So the, n the variable name will be passed to the upper filter, or basically it will be passed to the upper fu function, and it will uppercase every character in our string. And we want to allow the users to provide their own filters, not only the filters that come together with Jinja. And for that, I'm going to show you, uh, so what I'm going to show you is an example of such a filter and how we might be able to, uh, via our application, to find that uh, extra filter and to register as part, it as part of our Jinja environment, as part of our application. So let's take a look at this new Jinja filter. I decided for the, for the sake of the example, I created the camel filter, which basically takes the, ca the, the, the words on the left side and creates it as a camel case. Very useful, by the way, in hardware engineering. A lot of, ti a lot of times the code we want to spit out is register names, all kinds of uh, memories, and in our, in our code we want this uh, in camel case. So this is an implementation for camel case quite straightforward, take cap words, which will take the, or which will take the string, split it up in the, into pieces based on the separator, capitalize every, uh, every first word, and put it all together, remove any white strings, uh, any white spaces, and we'll lowercase the first character. So how can we import this dynamically? For that, we will leverage the capability of import lib. And for those of you who will be staying here, there is apparently another talk about import lib, which I suggest you listen to. But just a quick overview. So import lib, uh, import lib uh, allow is the mechanism that Python uses to, uh, to basically do uh, imports. So whenever you write import in your an import statement in your, your Python module, what happens behind the scenes is Python will go ahead to import lib and create uh, and, and create from that the, the specific the spec, uh, which from that will create the module, and finally it will execute that module to to get the namespace of that of whatever has been imported. So all of this is the mechanism that, run, uh, that runs behind the import lib, and that, and by using, by leveraging the spec from file location, you can actually pass in any file and load it on the fly. And this filter file, obviously, we passed it along via the configuration. And then we use the inspect module. The inspect allows you to inspect whatever is live currently in your, Pi in your Python application. So if you have any classes, any objects 
that are running. You can you have a whole uh, there's a whole bunch of methods over there that you can take a look. Uh, you can use them to get an introspection of what is what is currently running. And using uh, the get members, you can get the get members of any object. And we pass in the module that we just loaded, and we filter out anything that is a function. And this is the way we can do the first part we need for our, our plugin architecture, because the plugin architecture actually requires two, point, uh, two things. The first part is the lookup. Lookup means we need to know, uh, we need to tell our application how will they be able to figure out where the code is that they need. So the first part, uh, so the first part we managed. The first part we gave them a file, and from that file they, uh, uh, we gave them a path to a file, and from that file they managed to figure out the name and the, uh, the name and the callable. But then comes the second part. The second part is what's called registration, and registration is basically providing our application the information so that they can uh, they, they are able to the application is able to run our code. And for that, uh, just uh, going back a, a bit to Jinja, Jinja has the notion of a Jinja environment. So when you create, when you cr uh, to apply some data to a template, you need to create a Jinja environment. And in that environment, you have a dictionary of filters. And by providing that diction to that dictionary of filters, you by providing a name and a name callable pair, we can actually update that dictionary and uh, allow it to, kn uh, to know about our updated filters. So, yeah, the Zen of Python states there should be only a single way, or preferably one way to do it. But with plugin architectures, that doesn't really work. We have multiple ways how this is done. And uh, I'm going to show only two ways in the, uh, during this lecture. But I have in the resources all the way at the end uh, of those slides. If anybody is, in, uh, is interested in to download them, I've got references to even other ways to implement this. And now I want to introduce the entry point mechanism. And I'm going to use it uh, again for our, for our example application the, to add other data parsers. So if we take a look again uh, at our example application, we have here uh, we, have, uh, we have multiple data sources, not only JSON, and some of them are, are actually proprietary. Okay, XML and YAML obviously not, but we also have proprietary data sources. And we wanted to leverage the capability to allow the users to specify their own data source, and all they need is to provide a function which will return some dictionary, and then that could be, uh, can be plugged into our tool. And for that, we use the entry points mechanism. So a few words about entry points. Entry points is, uh, is, um, is uh, the, some metadata that is provided by, that can be exposed by packages when you install them. So if you ha uh, when you do a pip install, you, you can have in your package definition, uh, if it's a PyProject tumble, this is uh, the syntax, but you can also use it if you're using a setup CFG or setup Py. There is a s entry points specification, and you can provide an, an entry point in your as part of your package, and you can provide any group name, then, and then you have an, a key value pair where the value will actually be some way how to ac uh, access your code. And I'll explain. Uh, I'll explain shortly. When the entry point is loaded by your Python application it's roughly translated to the following code. So you import, you import, the, you import the code, and uh, you return the value of whatever, wh whatever was loaded. So now let's take a look at our new data parser. It's quite straightforward. YAML parser basically loading, loading, loading the text of the YAML file and returning a dictionary. And what we, told, uh, what we told our engineers is, when you package this YAML parser, so defi we define the name Cogen parsers. I mean, obviously, you can define any name you want. But we told them, in the key value pair, using in the key, specify the name of the suffix of the file. And that allows us to do the following. The I import lib has a metadata submodule. 
And under the metadata sub module, you will find the entry points. You will find the entry points method. By the way, this is from 3.10. I think it's uh, it's actually backported. Uh, it's backported, and you can load using entry points. So you can pr specify a group, and then you can get the all the of the entry points. And once we uh, once you have loaded them, so the get method will return will look up based on the name and since we told our engineers you you, you specify the suffix as the name of your entry point we are capable of uh, now leveraging this as such and this is uh, so we can when we get a date uh, file to be parsed we take uh, we look up the parser we obviously look in for a uh, look up first for any built-in parsers because we might actually have one of those and if we don't have one we'll check if by the, by any chance the uh, the specified uh, entry point via the plugin architecture so a quick recap of what we've seen here we've explained why we want to be able to we want to be able to extend our application and we want to remove the maintenance burden of the person who is maintaining that application and we explained for uh, we explained what we need for that for that we need lookup and registration we need the capability to look up any extra uh, 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 we need to uh, the capability first of all to know where to uh, where to find either, either by having the uh, the tool provides us uh, either have it provided by the configuration or provided by the metadata, and then registration. And we show two different ways how to how we are able to do this. The plugin architecture basically provides you the capability to support the unknown, of the unknown that you are unaware what uh, how your application will be able to be leveraged. Thank you very much. If you want, you, you can con uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, via GitHub. Thank you. <laughs>